everyone, and thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm sure that if you're in the audience and managing a website, I'm sure that you're very familiar with the topics that we're going to talk about today, which is BART. Over the years, their numbers and complexity has increased significantly, meaning that us defenders had to go in all lengths to, uh, to improve our detection in order to be able to, to keep up and stay ahead as much as possible uh, in order to be able to, uh, to detect them and defend the site against them. My, my name is David Senecal. I'm the VP of Product Architecture and Research at Arcos Labs. And I've been spending the last 10 years of my professional careers uh, chasing bots around the internet. And with me, I've got a pleasure to, uh, to have uh, Luke Stork. Hi, thanks, David. Yeah, I'm Luke Stork. I've been uh, working in data science, and, data science and machine learning for about the last five or six years. I uh, uh, started at the Air Force Research Lab doing com human computer interface research, um, then moved on to a biometric startup. And throughout the last year, I've been working with David on trying to improve uh, a product for detecting bot and, 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 and human fraud. Right, so today let, let's talk about the agenda. So first, you know, we I talked briefly about introducing the topic of bots. Uh, uh, let, let's talk first about the, the type of attacks that we are seeing. And second, I think it's uh, it would be good to, to kind of talk about as well, uh, what drives the attack sophistication? You know, why do we see uh, the persistence in those attacks over and over again? And, like I said earlier, I've been doing this for, for the last 10 years. And over time, I've seen the attack evolve pretty significantly. And I want to give you an insight about what I've seen over the last 10 years, where we were 10 years ago and where we are now. Um, and um, as a follow-up, then we'll, we'll double click in some of the most complex and advanced methods that we're using today, which is behavioral detection. So without further ado, let's look into the type of attacks. So when we talk about attacks, we talk, um, you sometimes hear about account takeover, fake account creations, carding, denial of inventory, inventory scraping. But what do they really mean? So for example, uh, account, account takeover. Typically those account takeover really take place on the login endpoint where attackers are typically buying uh, credentials that were stolen on the internet and then posted um, posted on the dark web. And there's a lot of marketplace available out there where you can actually buy cred uh, stolen credentials. And what attackers do is that they buy those credentials and keep replaying them over and over again against multiple targets, um, taking advantage of the fact that a lot of the internet users actually end up reusing the same username and password across uh, a lot of websites, meaning that if a credential is valid on one given website where the credential were stolen, chances are it's also valid on other websites. And then once um, they verify that a credential is valid, then um, they can take over the account or actually resell those verified accounts to somebody else to take it to the next level and take over the account. So Luke, what do you know about uh, fake account creation? Yeah, fake account creation is another really common type of attack, and um, it's you know common on many different types of platforms, from you know e-commerce to travel websites to you know uh, what we hear in the news like social media accounts with with fake accounts that you know s spread misinformation and, and and spam. So yeah, it's it's a really common type of abuse, and it it can happen in a, a number of different forms. You know, you could have a a human actor that that's coming in there and just putting in fake information and creating these accounts one by one, or you could have an automated system that, that goes in um, and, and really rapidly creates a high volume of accounts. Um, but, but it's a particularly bad type of attack because it, it can only take one or two accounts, say on like, like a gaming platform, you have one or two fake accounts that get created. Um, and, and these accounts can really be, you know, they can spam other users and, and really degrade the user experience for, for everyone on the site. So, so it's a really uh, a really bad type of attack that that can happen. So yeah, and uh, you know one point to additional point is like once the fake account is created, 
they can potentially be used to, uh, you know, to to take to do a different type of attack, which, for example, carding. Yeah. So they would reuse the fake account to actually test uh, credit card numbers uh, to see to see if they're valid or not, and then validate and make purchase from them. Uh, or also uh, try to, to do the similar things with gift cards. So that's you know pretty much like the, the second layer of that attack is is typically carding. Uh, so look, what what do you know about inventory scraping? Yeah, yeah, it's it's another type of attack, and and you know it it might not even be necessarily an attack. There's there's a lot of you know benign automation on on the internet, and actually you know most web traffic is is this type of you know benign automation that that um, you know d- just has these web scrapers that that go around the web that aggregate information that that um, figure out the best price for goods and services. So so th- these types of automation aren't necessarily bad and, and they help the internet function. But but what makes it bad is is when when this automation goes to to try to find information that that we don't want it to see. It, it tries to scrape information, personal information from social media profiles or or, or or tries to dig in further to get information that we don't want it to see. So um, that, that's where it really becomes an attack, and 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 we want to be able to detect and stop those cases. Yeah. So, for example, like web search engine, obviously, is good traffic that we want to see. A web website owners do want web search engine to actually go through their site so that their mm-hmm. content can be indexed and made available to uh, uh, to users. But you know, obviously, when uh, that the scraping is done by competitors who's trying to take an advantage on the pricing and so on. Uh, that that's definitely bad things, and sometimes it can lead to uh, some sort of various serious issues for, for the website owner. Take the travel industry, for example. Uh, if too much of the scraping is done, and uh, depending on the workflow uh, from the within the website, uh, it can sometimes lead to actually denial of inventory because the scraper is potentially trying to you know check uh, the availability of say of a, um, a seat on a plane or room in a hotel. Uh, while they do this, uh, sometimes you have process where the, the actual room or the seat is kind of locked for a little while, and then that can lock the whole inventory for all legitimate other users who may actually want to, uh, to purchase um, the, those, uh, those available seats or room. Uh, so it can definitely lead to some serious, uh, you know, has some fi- serious consequences. Uh, financial consequences for for the actual website owner. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So so you outlined all these types of attacks, but so Dave, you've been working in this for a while. Like, what 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 drives like this attack sophistication? What why why do they get really really sophisticated? Yeah. So what I've learned typically is really what drives the sophistication of the attack is the it's pretty much the the potential for monetization of the content that's being abused. So the the lower if the pot- potential for monetization is low, then potentially you'll see a sophistication of the attacks that you know that that's pretty low as well, and the persistence is pretty persistence is pretty low. So you're gonna find like more basic botnets who um, who do do their things, and as soon as you got a decent defense in place, then they will go away and they will try to uh, to go after a different target. However, if the, um, the potential for monetization is very high, uh, you know, let's say by spending one hour and trying to get the content and they can have a resale value for $100, let's say, or, or even more, then uh, you know, the, the value for them is so much uh, that it's actually they can make a good living out of, out of this. So in that case, they, um, they will try very hard to actually... Uh, uh, defeat all detection in place, and that's where you're going to see the most sophisticated attacks uh, with with you know very high persistence. You know, I, I've seen over the years uh, some accounts that I've been working with where pretty much they're one of a kind, where you know they the value from abusing logins or cracking an account or abusing some gift card um, or, or loyalty points um, uh, program. It's so lucrative that the attackers will keep going at it no matter how many how much defense that you have in place mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so what kind of you, you have these really sophisticated um attacks that happen so i i'm sure there's kind of a spectrum of attacks that, that we see so like what what's a good starting point like a, a really basic form i guess 
Yeah, I mean, you cannot bring him back. It bring me back to like 10 years ago where I started uh, trying to uh, to play around defending against botnets. And, uh, you know, at the time, things were much easier because the botnets were pretty small, fairly unsophisticated. That were, We were looking at like very fairly basic scripts. Uh, the number of nodes within the botnets was fairly limited. You're talking about like maybe a few dozens of botnets or nodes within the botnets. So in that case, you know, defending were, was pretty easy where... Pretty much IP blocking would do it. You know, that was that wasn't that hard to actually do the inventory of IPs that would that would attacking you because uh, it's easy to find them because you would see like a very large number of requests coming from a very specific set of IPs where the rest, you know, is pretty much in the uh, in the lower much lower range. So IP blocking would do the trick. Uh, rate limiting as well would do the trick. And because uh, the script was so simplistic. Uh, then, you know, a set of custom rules would do the trick as well because the, the format of the request would put on sh- potentially very different than the format of legitimate request coming from a regular Chrome or Firefox. So then it's well, easy enough to, uh, to detect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So, okay, so you got these, I, I guess, dumb bots, but what, what's like the next, next stage from there? How do they get, you know, more sophisticated? Yeah, so basically the level of sophistication increase as your level of detection increase. So then the next stage, when you've got all this uh, you know, very basic detection in place, typically what you'll see is that the botnet will evolve. They become larger to, uh, to evade your IP blocking. It's harder for you to do the inventory. Uh, and then re- because the botnet is larger, we're talking about maybe a few hundreds uh, nodes within the botnet, then in that case, rate limiting becomes less effective because each node within the botnet is able to only make a few requests per, per, per minute or per second. And, you know, it feels it it's blends in uh, with the, the, you know, the, the rest of the crowd. Uh, I, so to defend against this, then, um, uh, you know, that's where IP intelligence comes in because where IP blocking rate limiting will fail, if you look at the traffic from a longer per- period of time, if you look at the reputation of an IP over a long, longer period of time, so what you get typically from IP intelligence then in that case, you will be able to, um, to kind of differentiate between potentially the, you know, de- detect the nodes within the botnets. But that's, that's not enough because, um, you know, another thing that you need to do is typically those basic bots, they don't run JavaScript. So what you can do is actually inject um, some, some JavaScript challenge into your code uh, to be able to validate whether they do um, run JavaScript or not. And if they do, then you want to collect the fingerprints from them to kind of you know, look at the device characteristic and these sort of things um, to kind of see what kind of system you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we got you know a hundred node botnet that can run JavaScript. What's what's the next level of sophistication from there? Right. So yeah, of course, you know, my, my job is never over and our job is never over. Right. So, you know, once now you're, you're happy, you kind of dealt with your larger botnet, you feel like you're, you've done it all and you've, you've taken care of the problem. Fortunately, that's not the case because for, again, if the, 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 the incentive is there, then the attackers will go above and beyond <clears throat> to try to defeat your detection. So the next stage is actually the botnet go even, goes even larger. You know, we were talking about a few hundred nodes, and now we're talking about a few thousand nodes. And it's actually not uncommon to actually see botnets that are, you know, have more than 10,000 nodes uh, within, the bot, within the network. So that's, you know, then that case IP intelligence becomes, you know, that, that doesn't, that it's not very efficient. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and as well, um, you know, when we test for, whether the client support JavaScript, our one our way, our, one of our basic way to know whether the client support JavaScript or not is if we see that they're sending a fingerprint, then that's like okay, now you you're good, you're you're giving us a finger, your fingerprint. Therefore, you must be uh, running JavaScript. That it's easy enough for an attacker to actually simulate sending a fingerprint. They know that that's what we expect. Uh, so therefore, they're going to just give us a fingerprint, and uh, and sometimes what they do is like. They randomize certain values within the device characteristics that we want to collect. Actually, it's very common. And uh, <clears throat> so that to, to kind of defeat any detection in place that would pinpoint on very specific characteristics, like particular version of browser, OS, or you know, c- certain characteristics. So then in that case, uh, in terms of detection, you, you again, you have to advance a lot more, like a simple rule engine for looking at specific, uh, specific characteristics or anomalies 
uh, won't do it. Uh, you need something a bit more advanced with like device intelligence, for example, who can recognize you know, legitimate system versus non-legitimate system, meaning legitimate fingerprint versus non-legitimate fingerprints. Uh, proof of work as well is a good way to force the client to actually um, uh, <clears throat> uh, run the JavaScript because proof of work will is based on the JavaScript ability to, to kind of resolve a cryptographic challenge. And the cryptographic challenge will be unique every time, so it cannot be pre-computed. Pre so in that case, uh, you know, it's a good way to, to really force a client to, to, to run JavaScript. And of course, you need to also be sure you have some replay detection in place. Uh, because you know some attackers will be clever enough to kind of replay a good fingerprint, and you need to be able to recognize that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have really, really large botnets now that can run JavaScript and spoof legitimate device signatures. But like, how does it get any more sophisticated from there? Oh, uh, it always gets the more sophisticated, and um, you know, once you really push them to run JavaScript, then they go headless browsers because headless browsers, of course, they can run JavaScript all day long. So then your proof of work becomes ineffective. Device Intel also becomes somewhat ineffective because, in that case, the finger, the 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 signature of the that the headless browser send is, is valid. You know, like headless Chrome is the same as Chrome in terms of fingerprint, or there's very little difference. Sometimes you can make out. Um, so that then, you know, you really need to, uh, to kind of step up your headless browser detection. And then you also need to look at how the user is interacting with a system, with the, with a machine that, that you're receiving the request from and, uh, how it's interacting with the website of all. So that's where we start talking about behavioral detection, which is, you know, the bulk of our topic today. And that's where you come in, Luke. So Luke, Luke sorry, um, tell us about behavioral detection. What, what, what does it mean? What is it like? Yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's a couple of different sides of that. There's, for behavioral detection, there's behavioral biometrics, um, which, which is, we'll, we'll touch on a bit later. Um, and, and then kind of a, a broader, more, more simplistic arm of behavioral detection, which is user behavioral analysis. Um, and this is kind of just a high level method that, that looks at a way a, a user interacts with a web service. Um, and, and this can be, you know, just, just the series of steps they take when they're, you know, logging into an account or, or making a purchase, just, just those high level contextual interactions is, is kind of what comprises user behavioral analysis. Um, and it also can take into consideration, you know, the, their, their geolocation and, uh, the, the the timing of the visits and and the the frequency of page interaction. So so those those really high level metrics. Okay, and so what about uh, behavioral biometrics? And what um, well, what does it mean really? What what are we lo looking at? Yeah yeah. So so behavioral biometric detection is is different from behavioral analysis because we're looking at like the actual ways that a, a user interacts with their device. So. For like a, a, a traditional desktop session, we're looking at these uh, mouse and keyboard events, the, the actual you know, frequency of these typing events, the, the speed of their mouse motion and, and those sort of things. And then for the, the, the mobile side of things, we're, we're looking at the, the touch interactions on their phone um, and even more complex systems can look at you know, motion sensor events and, and, and that sort of thing. All right, so we're gonna dig uh, double click on each one of this detection method to really you know, give give some insight to our audience about what you know what, what that means and what the really text to to kind of handle these sort of signals. Uh, but before we do that, let's go over like you know, kind of discuss the the use case we're trying to resolve with behavioral detection. So again, you know, botnet detection is definitely uh, one one good use case to be really really be able to differentiate to kind of by seeing how the 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 client is interacting with the site or the machine, then we can differentiate between automation and, and human. But also by, by looking at how the interaction is happening, we can potentially also start differentiating between legitimate users and people who want to start committing fraud. So you kind of get maybe a bit of a sense of the intent as well. Uh, but not only that, um, that's also a good way to, to evaluate um, you know, for, for legitimate users uh, that has no bad behaviors and they're just doing the stuff that we expect their regular users to do, uh, then uh, to be able to better uh, identify them so that we can give them a better user experience when they're returning to the site. So let's uh, dig deeper into the user behavior analysis. So, you know, Luke, tell us, tell us more. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so a deeper dive into this this aspect of behavioral detection, um, and, and again, we're looking at these these high level contextual interactions. Um, and and kind of here on on the right, we have a the, like a heat map of mouse motion. So, a lot of these metrics kind of overlap with uh, techniques that marketers use to to examine, you know, interactions with with ads or or you know, user experience researchers that that want to know how how effectively a user can can navigate through a website. So a lot of those same metrics can be used on on the security side of things to 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 verify like the authentic the authenticity of of a user session. So kind of more more granularity into those metrics. We're we're going to be looking at like the, the number of pages that that they visited. Maybe maybe the the sequence of events that that led them up to this session, and that can be really telling for for um, kind of a contextual point of view. You know, if if you're seeing a lot of sessions that you know just just begin their their browsing session with with this page over and over again. You know that that might be a red flag for 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 um, detection. Um, and again, like on that same note, the, the visit frequency to a page are are they you know trying to visit a login page you know ten times a day, twenty times a day? That's that that could be a red flag as well. Um, and again, the 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 time spent per visit and per page is you know a key metric because. Like, like David outlined earlier, we have these really complex automated systems and, and they're financially motivated. So they want to be really efficient with how they navigate these web pages. So, so they're going to be, they're going to do these actions as quick as they can to, to really um, improve their margins on their, the fraud they're trying to commit. So the time spent per page is, is really key because normal user browsing, you know, you're going to scroll down a page, you're going to pause, you're going to hover, you're going to read. It's you just don't see see that type of behavior for for really really large automated systems. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know the one point that you're making, like on the how the user is browsing the website, how is they accessing a particular resource. I've seen that many many times in the past, where uh, especially on the case of account takeover or credential stuffing attack, where they're replaying a large list of, of username and password. All too often, what you're seeing is just they're simply making a post request with a login. They're not even you know, going in any user web page before, not the home page, not browsing any product if it's a commerce site, and not even load, loading the, the login form itself. Uh, directly, all you see is a post request. So that's definitely can can be a good uh, way to tell, uh, you know, where we're dealing with uh, legitimate activity or not. Yeah, yeah, just it just misses that context going up to that event, yeah. Yeah, so now let's talk a bit more about the uh, behavioral biometrics. So let's talk about, uh, you know, the sort of data points that we want to uh, to collect in that case from, you know, depending on the type of client, because imaging between, um, you know, desktop, laptop, bra- uh, um, uh, mobile devices, and even in our case at Arcos, we're actually dealing with like even game console and smart TVs. So then the, the interaction with those type of device is completely different. So, Mm-hmm. What does it look like from the point of view of uh, you know desktop and laptop more traditional devices? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's exactly that. That's where behavioral biometrics traditionally originated was kind of these this desktop session of these mouse and keyboard events. We're looking at you know the frequency of keystrokes and and, and the the speed of the mouse motion. That's that's the traditional form of behavioral biometrics. Yeah, and, and then we go on to the the uh, kind of the mobile world where. Um, we're gonna. We don't have those those mouse events or those those key events necessarily. So we're gonna have to look at you know touch interactions on the device and and those motion sensor events to give to give context to that user session. Yeah, yeah, that can be a bit cri- cri- tricky with mobile because you can actually hook up uh, as well a keyboard or mouse to a mobile device, where sometimes would not. And you know that's kind of a bit of a, a blur sometimes. And you do also have some laptops now that actually do support. Uh, uh, touch on the on the screen so yeah that, that that's a great point it, it's not really a, you can't cleanly separate devices into mobile and desktop necessarily anymore it's 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 kind of a, a hybrid you have you know yeah touch screen interactions and it, it can be difficult to differentiate yeah uh, for sure so what about uh you know the smart tvs game console what do we get out of those like when i'm interacting with my remote on my smart tv to try to log in on on netflix for example what kind of interaction can you get out of that yeah, yeah, and, and again, this is a whole another world for for data collection here. Uh, for like game controllers, a, a lot of those events get get translated down into you know key press events and, and that sort of thing. So so we can interpret that information that way. But 
you know, it, it, there, there's a whole other world that's that's coming with these IoT devices. I mean, you have your th thermostats and doorbells and, you know, your, your refrigerator interactions. So it, it just, it's a whole world of different interactions that we're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, <laughs> the fun never ends for us. <laughs> right. All right. Cool. So, um, uh, right. So, I mean, obviously rich, rich amount of data, tons of data here, but how, you know, how do we sample what, what's the right sampling of, of that, that sort of data? Yeah. Yeah. And this is a really important point to have a successful behavioral biometric implementation. It's, it's all about how you sample the data um, because these, these, these types of events have a huge volume of data. You, you can't, you simply can't adjust it all. Like you would ruin the client experience. You would overload your database and you wouldn't even be able to get the information you want. So you have to really be smart about how you sample it. And in the first and, and kind of simplest way to do that is in an unconstrained way across, you know, say a web page, you, you're going to sample this information at maybe, you know, a, a one to two second interval um, per, per event. And you would just collect, you know, whatever mouse events happen in that window, whatever key press events happen in that window. And you would just make sure that they're consistent with what, what the client should be sending you. And uh, another form of this, um, the other, the other side of the coin, I guess, is constrained sampling. Um, and this is when you have a specific window that, that you're looking to collect these events in. Um, and, and this is, you know, say during password entry or um, like in our case, during, during a, a CAPTCHA session. So you're, you have this specified window and you're, you're, you're going to collect all these events and you're going to make sure that they're, they're consistent and they have the information that you want. And, and again, you, you, you just can't collect all the data. So, so you really have to narrow down that window that, you, that you're focusing on. Well, 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 typically how, you know, what's the sample side you're looking at? How many events are, are good enough uh, to, to have like a good, good sample to work with? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, th there's definitely a spectrum. I mean, for, for simple bot detection, you know, a case would be just, just make sure the client sends you mouse events. Just make sure that those events are there. That, that's the simplest case. And then like, like we'll touch on a little bit later, like um, if you want really sophisticated bot detection, you're going to have to collect more data. You're going to have to look at, you know, the, the time series of that data to make sure that, that it actually looks like it's human. So um, basically, like, like your earlier point, the, the more sophisticated you want your detection to be, the more data you're going to have to collect. Okay. So let's look now at... Uh you know, how we use that data, right? So now we got, let's say, look at, we are looking at our mouse, uh, mouse, mouse, mouse data, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So how, what can we do with that? Yeah, yeah. So, so the simplest form of looking at mouse motion data is, is just the timing, just looking at the trajectory of a mouse or touchpad interaction. And here on the left, we have, you know, a simple human interaction. This, this is the mouse X coordinate um, on the y-axis versus time on the right. So this is just someone clicking at the top of a page and moving their mouse uh, to the right a little bit. And you can kind of see on this trajectory here, it's, uh, it's, it's not really even, you kind of get lumps of those coordinates. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, you get those kind of curvy things at the end. It's a little bit chaotic and, and not, not the cleanest necessarily. And then here on, on the right, uh, we have a, a, a machine profile on the same web page that was just, um, this would be the, the, the really dumb bot that David outlined earlier that, that's just explicitly programmed to, to click certain events. And you can see it's just really clean. Uh, the events happen at a specified interval. Um, you, you, don't, you don't have that really rich time series trajectory. Okay, okay. So time motion is, is one thing. So what else, what else can we use? Yeah, yeah. And again, as we move up this sophistication line here to detect more sophisticated bots, we can look at the, the velocity of the mouse motion. So um, on the left here with the, the uh, human motion, that, that, that same motion that we were looking at on the last slide, uh, the velocity profile of this, you can kind of see these peaks and valleys. It's, it, 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 it moves quickly and slowly. It's, it's, it's not, not really clean, not linear. Um, and that's that's typical human web interactions. They're 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 chaotic and messy. There's there's really no rhyme or reason for events. Sometimes it's 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 kind of jagged and peaks and valleys. Yeah, right. And it, and, and then on on the right for for the machine interaction, you're going to get really linear events um, for for these simplistic interactions. And um, it'll be a consistent velocity from from one point to another. 
and you're not going to see that, that 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 sort of the the rich profile that you do on the left. All right, all right, cool, it's fascinating. So, and so, what about acceleration? Yep, taking it a, another degree further. So, say you have a sophisticated bot that can, you know, move at a, 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 a you know, non-constant velocity. Um, we can examine the acceleration profile of the mouse motion. So, again, this is that same time series trajectory that we're looking at from the first slide. Um, and it, the acceleration profile, is, it, it's really telling. So with, with this human motion, you see that kind of jitter there. Um, it's, it's, it's uneven, lots of peaks and valleys. And, and that's what we want to see for a normal, a normal human interaction with, with a touchpad or mouse. Um, and then on the, the machine on the right, again, e even the acceleration profile, you have those, those really linear um, uh, types of trajectories and, and you don't kind of get that, the, the, those jagged peaks and valleys. Yeah, I like, you know, can definitely see some kind of pulse on the left, whereas on the right, uh, yeah. there's definitely no pulse. The guy is on the life support right there. <laughs> yeah, there's signs of life on the left for sure. <laughs> All right. Um, now, uh, so I'm mouse movement, obviously, uh, you know, we get a ton of those when it comes to laptop and, dev and desktop devices. Uh, but now we, let's look at the, the mobile world. So touch events, you know, what, what do you, what do you get out of that? Is that as rich as what we would get from a uh, uh, mouse event? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it depends, you know, typically with touch interactions, you don't have that, the, the full trajectory of, of like a mouse motion event. So, so with the touch interaction, you don't get to see where that interaction began and where it ended. Um, because you just you have those those single points on a screen. So right. like like with the human here on the left, um, yeah, we, we don't have that trajectory, but you can kind of see there's there's a couple points clustered together there. They're, they're kind of smudges, they're they're uneven. Um, the time won't be constant in between these touch interaction events. Um, so, so that's what we're kind of looking for 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 human touch events. And then on the right with a, a machine touch profile, what, what we'll, we'd be looking for, just missing events altogether. If, if you say you're a, a mobile device with a touch screen um, and you're sending only these these events as mouse events, you know th that that will be a rule that we're looking for for detection. Um, and then again, looking looking for only these those those single data point coordinates instead of kind of the the smudge interactions. Right. Yeah, I mean, obviously the touch event is probably easier for, for bots to, to kind of fake in that scenario because you have far mm -hmm. less to work with and then your algorithm won't be as uh, as accurate. Um, yeah. uh, so, it, it, go ahead. Th there's even research that that's trying to tie motion sensor events like accelerometer and gyroscope to these touch screen right. interactions to, to make sure they're legitimate as well. So so there's there's another dimension that could be even taken further, yeah. Right, so yeah, that's a topic we won't uh, we won't touch uh, too much today. But yeah, definitely in the case of mobile, then potentially you have the opportunity to have much richer um, uh, signals that you can work with to kind of see how the user actually interact, you know, handle this device, and and then to mm -hmm. compensate for this lack of interaction on the touch on the screen event. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now let's talk about, um, you know, keyboard, uh, like, you know, we all have keyboard, we all day in, day out, you know, the time of pandemics typing away at our keyboard. So there's probably some rich interaction we can get out of that. So what do we collect exactly? Do you really collect my, what I'm typing or do you collect something else? No, no. And that's a good point, David. And we should have highlighted this early. This, this is, we don't want to collect what a user is typing. We, we want to collect the, the dynamics of the events, but we don't want the content, you know, and, and that's a liability to even have the content for your website. Like you just don't want to collect that information and it doesn't help with your purpose for detection either. So, so, so what we collect with, with key press is, is the, the, the timing of the keystroke. So, you know, how long a key is held down and then the, the difference between that key press event and the next one. So, so that, that, that downtime in between the next key and the other one. And, you know, this, this is really rich. Just the, the temporal interactions that a user has on their keyboard is, is, is really telling. So, so you can use that for um, both bot detection, whereas, you know, a bot, you know, you might not even have those key press events at all. That, that, that information might just, you know, automatically be entered into forms um, for like human fraud detection. It might be uh, very quick. You might see a lot of copy paste events. 
Um, and, and then like, like you, we touched on earlier for, for saying user authentication, uh, someone's typing pattern can potentially be uniquely identifying. So that's, that's another point. Yeah, well, I feel much better than now, you know, snooping on all everything that I'm <laughs> tapping over email. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a point that we need to, uh, to make sure that, that we're making. Uh, all of this detection, of course, has to follow, uh, you know, regulation like GDPR and CCPA in California. And, uh, and you know, we, we, can't, we can't collect whatever we want, but we need to collect enough so that we, can, we, we, we are able to, uh, to be able to build detection around it. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, okay, so, I mean, the biggest problem that we have in the industry in terms of, you know, when we detect, when we launch a new detection, is always, uh, at the end of the day, um, the most common way for attackers is to do spoofing. So spoofing of behavioral, um, sorry, spoofing of device characteristic and the data we're collecting through fingerprint, uh, fingerprinting with JavaScript. Uh, it's very common. I've seen that for many years. Do we see the same problem with uh, uh, behavioral biometrics and how do we handle this? Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, for, for any detection system, you're, the data is going to be spoofed for it. It's, it's, it's just known. It's, it's, it's just a cat and mouse game. No matter what, if you're looking for device characteristics, the attacker is going to spoof those. It's, 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 just, it's just how it happens. So yeah, of course, behavioral biometric data gets, gets spoofed um, very often. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to spoof it as well. Um, I, the, probably the most common and easiest way to do this is to uh, just just record the normal user interaction. So an attacker might just you know collect their mouse events as they go to create an account and play those back into their automation system. So um, that that's a really common and probably the easiest way to do it. Um, but but we can we can detect those events by looking for these type of, of replay events. So um, just looking for that that exact same input that was um, sent before, you know, you can detect that very easily. Um, and then the, the the next stage of that would be kind of uh, the attacker might modify that signal, just put a little bit of noise in there for that same uh, replay session. Um, and again, with with some filtration and and, and kind of statistical techniques. Um, th that sort of replay attack can be detected as well. Um, and, and then there's, you know, on the most sophisticated side of things, there's, you know, there's behavioral biometric systems, you know, you know, machine learning systems that can generate mouse, mouse coordinates and um, they can generate realistic keystroke, like, like realistic keystroke events. So um, it, it can get really sophisticated, but again, there has to be that, that monetization incentive. To, to do that, to spend the time to, to implement one of those systems. Yeah, and I guess that's, you know, then that means that we're going to have to come up with something new after behavioral biometric and behavioral detection. We have to come up with something new uh, to, be, to be able to go beyond, uh, you know, the fact that you know, over time they're going to get better. Uh, the attacker is going to get better at detecting all this, uh, no, sorry, the, the replaying and uh, simulating all this uh, behavior that we're, we're doing. It's it definitely increase the cost for the attacker. So then it's, you know, but again, it's uh, based on the motivation. Uh, the higher motivation, the most likely is they're going to, uh, uh, to, to be able to go, to go that way. Um, but at least we are raising the bar. Yeah? And mm -hmm. that's, that's also still good overall. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. Just that, that monetization potential is, 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 is really what, what drives the sophistication. Yeah. 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 So let's talk a little bit about the, the pros of the cons of behavioral detection, because it sounds very complicated. It sounds very promising, but it sounds very complex. So tell us about, you know, the pros of, of behavioral detection. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll start with the pros for this. And, and really the main benefit of behavioral biometrics is that they're passive, that they happen naturally in the background. Um, it's, it's not a captcha that you're imposing on the user. It's not additional friction when, when a user goes to make a purchase, it's, it, it, it really doesn't reduce the user experience at all. So um, that's, that's really the main pro of them, you know, it, it, there's no friction. Um, so, so in addition to that kind of passive detection mode, um, the, another benefit is that they're, they're really unique and independent from other forms of, you know, traditional detection that, that David talked about earlier. It's, it's, it's an independent signal from like your, your IP information, um, it's an independent signal from, you know, what, whatever device that you're using, 
um, and it, it can really act as a, a you know differentiator for for detection systems. Um, and then another pro for for behavioral detection implementations is they're they're really hard to spoof in an intelligent way. Um, you know, you can do those simplistic replay attacks, but um, if if you really have a good behavioral biometric system, um, it's the bar is pretty high for for attackers to 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 really to spoof that stuff in a, a, a complex way, and they they really have to be motivated, and it has to be a a system with that that monetization potential for them to to really use those those smart methods. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So now let's uh, let's talk about the inconvenience of uh, behavioral biometric. Yeah, behavioral yeah, it's, detection of all. It, right, right, and it's not a perfect world. So on the other side of the coin, there's there's many cons to uh, behavioral biometric implementation. Um, the, the main one is it's uh, really complex. There's a lot of development that needs to go in upfront. Um, these systems really need to be maintained. Like the the way you sample the data needs to be implemented in a smart way to begin with. It needs to be maintained across you know dozens, hundreds, however many devices that that you're going to see across this. Um, and then you have to be able to store that data um, in a, an intelligent way. And it, it's, it's very, very complicated. And then once you have all that data in your database, uh, you're going to have to be able to perform computation on it. You're going to have to be able to filter it to be able to find the events that you want. So it's, it's uh, really data intensive, computationally intensive. Um, and then also on the last point, um, like we touched on a bit earlier, there's, there's privacy concerns. So um, initially when you're sampling this data, you don't want to collect any PII information. You don't want to collect these, these explicit key, key events. And um, you really have to be smart about what data you're collecting. So uh, with all the benefits it brings, there's, there's a lot of uh, maintenance and, and, and cons on the other side of the coin. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're going to be very busy for the next uh, few months or even years, Luke. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, so one uh, one aspect that you brought up earlier on is like uh, what we, we talked about briefly is like you know in a way it's frictionless system and potentially it can help for user authentication. So tell us about you know how behavioral detection at the end help with user authentication. Yeah, yeah, good point. And, and this is a bit separate from from you know bot detection and human fraud detection. Right. This is a, a bit of a separate avenue in itself, but but it can also help to you know streamline the user experience and and you know help them not see captures and 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 really make make the web experience a bit better. So um, the, the way kind of behavioral profiling works for you know when when a user has an account with a web service, they'll you know interact with that account for the first time. Um, Say, say they're they're registering for an account and, and, and maybe they log in for the first time. Um, we're gonna check to see if, if this user exists in the database at all. Um, do they have a profile? Have we collected data on them before? Um, and if, if that's not the case, um, we're gonna go on the, the right side of this um, flow chart here. Um, and uh, we're gonna collect data from that session and uh, either store that in a local or remote database. And then the user carries on with that transaction. So the next time they, they uh, use this service or interact with, with the website, um, we're gonna go through that same check. And we'll do this um, a, a number of times until that user has enough, enough data collected on them, enough you know, keystroke events until we know, you know what time of day they usually use the service, um, you know, what, what geolocation that they typically come from. And then um, once we have enough of that, that rich data set, um, you know, we can use some sort of um, basic statistics or, or, or thresholding to, to learn that profile. Um, and then the next time that they um, use this service, we're gonna run their information through that profile um, and then either, you know, authenticate or reject them. Or what, what's more likely is, is there's kind of a, a confidence score for that user. So when that user goes into that um, web interaction, you know, it would be, you know, a score from zero to 100 that, you know, we're seventy five percent sure that that this is actually you interacting with this website, and then other other uh, methods like a capture could come into play or, or or whatever it may be. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if I you know what what I like about the behavioral detection of all is like you know it has it opens possibilities. It has several applications. So that's why <clears throat> we wanted to kind of share this kind of use case around authentication. But <clears throat> you know, in general, of course the you know that the, the bot and 
award is you know is good for Barton Newman for detection. Uh, one one thing is important to uh, to remind as well is uh, you know basically behavioral detection on its own you know it's not typically uh, you know it's a layer within a system that that you're you're deploying typically just having like behavioral detection on its own um, may not get enough context uh, to to be able to be successful. So typically behavioral detection uh, is deployed within a system that includes things like device intelligence that I mentioned earlier as part of some of the bot detection techniques where you can learn uh, what, you know, what, what's a good, uh, what, what are good, what good um, <laughs> uh, device, uh, digital device, what their fingerprint look like in the internet ecosystem. And that's evolved very rapidly because you know, every so often you got, uh, the Google, Apple, and and of the world to release new version of their product, and that in a, in a sense uh, may constantly evolve the, the internal ecosystem. So having a good device intelligence uh, system um, as part of the detection is is kind of a must. Then as for context as well, having um, network and IP intelligence to really know where the user is coming from, what kind of um, networks they're coming from, whether it's a data center or residential, or if it's a proxy, a VPN, or so, this sort of rich metadata that you can get from, uh, from IP intelligence kind of help kind of bring the context that can then be used as part of user behavior analysis. So device intelligence, network IP, uh, uh, IP intelligence is, and is definitely a key point to use as part of user behavior analysis to be able to, to understand like based on what the user is doing and based on their device and based on where they're, they're coming from, um, you know, kind of make some sense about what they're doing and make a determination be, be between whether they're human, bots, uh, good human or bad humans or potentially bad humans, right? And uh, behavioral biometric as well comes in uh, to, to kind of, you know, reinforce all these signals of, uh, uh, device intelligence, device intel, IP intel, and uh, user behavior analysis. Uh, but of course, you know, all of this needs to be processed in a fairly complex way. So that's where machine learning comes in. And uh, that's where, you know, Luke comes in, um, you know, in doing all the data science around it. Uh, or also some, some, sometimes some simple statistical model uh, can actually, uh, you know, do the trick and really help um, uh, provide a good level of accuracy. So, it's really a system, and uh, you know, here I've just uh, highlighted a few of the methods that we're typically using. There's always, you know, a few additional like, uh, you know, ray control and uh, you know, velocity and these sort of things that that comes into play. Uh, but of all, we want to kind of bring a home that this is a complex uh, system to put together, and. Uh, yeah, so that's great. And uh, so thank you, uh, Luke, for participating in this conversation. I think we've, we've learned a great deal from um, behavioral detection uh, today. And with that, I think we have some time to take some questions.